have to find a way to attack it. So I just ask that you be fully aware that you can't separate any new technology these days from cybersecurity. The two have to go together. And as technology evolves and as artificial intelligence evolves, it's, it's multiple things, it's not a single thing. We have to evolve the cybersecurity that goes with it. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Senator Klobuchar. Uh, thank you very much uh, to both of you. I'm excited about the work that's going on. Um, this summer I toured a number of firms in Minnesota that were making impressive use of precision agriculture. Uh, on one of the farms, the sprayer had been configured to only spray on plants that it correctly identified as weeds. I know you're seeing this all over uh, in our agriculture communities. Uh, we know it helps reduce input costs, better for conservation. That's why uh, Senator Fisher and I are joining uh, the uh, Precision, have introduced the Precision Agriculture Loan Act, and I know, uh, Dr. Heinemann, um, you mentioned uh, the Precision Ag Bill uh, in your testimony, which I uh, appreciate. Um, the, um, I guess I'd start with you, uh, Mr. Krishnan. In your testimony, you discussed the important role that federal financing opportunities can have in helping scale these kinds of technologies. Uh, could you talk a little more about that? I, mean, I, I think as agriculture goes from data poor to data rich, um, everyone's talking about precision agriculture, so drones, satellites, remote sensing, et cetera. We also see a more data-driven food and ag system to offer new risk management and lending solutions, particularly not only to adopt um, and, and de-risk the scaling of, of new technologies, but also create longer-term decision-making focused on soil health and sustainability. So I think that's a really important area for um, public policy to get involved in, to give farmers not just the tools, but the financing to increase uh, yield breaker and profit breaker. Uh, exactly. I mean, Senator Thune and I lead a different bill uh, that would require the USDA to identify and collect and analyze the data. Um, and so what you're saying is that it's helpful to have both the data as well as the financing. I think both are really important and critical. Okay. Uh, Dr. Earls, in your testimony, uh, you talked about the work uh, you are leading at UC Davis to develop AI-enabled sensing systems that help producers manage their operations more precisely. Um, can you talk about the, how that can help with costs in the long term? It's an investment in the short term. Please, thank you. Yes, absolutely. So in terms of on the farm, you know, we think of the breakdowns in terms of cost. I think more of specialty crops because I'm coming from California, uh, but I think this applies across many different types of crops uh, where we have all of these inputs that farmers are facing, they're spread across a number of different activities, right? So AI has the potential to hit various activities such as whether it be fertilization, pest management, uh, yield forecasting and prediction, uh, and other types of irrigation, so on. I think these are cost-saving measures that may be somewhere between 5 to 15 percent on average in any given farmer's operation. So one of the challenges in going from an idea to a product in agriculture for cost savings is, is finding those real value propositions, I think, in precision agriculture. And so what we've been working on is really identifying what those are. And so that really depends on what crop type we're looking at. And I think this is a big challenge for AI going forward is finding each one of those crop types pivot points that they're willing to bring AI into adoption. Um, the, um, you can't really do most of this without broadband. And um, as we know, that is a big piece of this to get broadband to every corner uh, of our country. Um, uh, we made sure that the bipartisan infrastructure law that many of us on th at this table supported uh, included a significant investment in broadband infrastructure. I actually led that bill um, before it got included in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Dr. Griffiths, can you talk about the importance of broadband to making AI-enabled ag technologies work for farmers, and how can we... Um, do more to uh, solve the workforce shortage, which is um, another issue that's plaguing us in rural. 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yes, I'll start with the broadband question. Um, given the fact that we are able to potentially generate huge amounts of data, we have to send the data somewhere, and we have to do it in a timely manner. And in order to do that, we need the broadband infrastructure to um, become you know, uh, ubiquitous across the entire country, but especially in the farmlands and uh, in, in the middle of the United States where it's not uh, necessarily uniformly available at this time. That's been something actually that I've testified on before and here it is again. Um, we can't ignore that as an enabling infrastructure for the use of many of these additional and new and emerging technologies. Um, so, uh, you know, even in South Dakota, we, we, we're doing pretty well on broadband infrastructure on one side of the state and the other side not so good. I mean, and, and then we have badlands and topologies that where it's very, very difficult to try and ensure that, that uh, equal access to uh, broadband technologies. But we're working on it and uh, uh, we'll continue to do so. Um, the workforce issue is, is another issue that's plaguing us because um, we really do not have um, sufficient numbers of people who are fully aware of the capabilities um, of artificial intelligence. I classify the workforce needs into three areas. We have uh, the need for additional experts who are actually going to help develop these AI-related applications to, uh, to agriculture and to other sectors, um, and we are in relatively short supply of those people. We need to encourage more people to go into STEM, and I think that particular issue won't be solved with domestic um, personnel alone. We're going to have to look at uh, legal immigration. The second area, though, we're going to have more people engaged in what we call the users. So we're going to have two kinds of users of AI technologies. They're the producers of products and services who are using AI technologies to create their offerings. And then we also have the end users of those products and services. So you could say the individual farmers or, or uh, ranchers who actually need to use those products and services. And then we ultimately have the general public. What should the general public know about artificial intelligence? So I think the, the key here is one, we do need more people moving into these fields. And secondly, we need to do more to educate the users and end, use, end users of the capabilities and the risks associated with these technologies so that we can develop um, uh, artificial uh, applications, artificial intelligence applications responsibly that actually do what we want them to do, that carry the kinds of values the United States wishes to spread and continue to spread um, around the world and minimize the, uh, the risk that's associated with these technologies so that we can optimize the use. Thank you. Thank you very much.